Yesterday we took a 20 inch piece of 8 inch by 1 inch flat bar and we forged a hinge strap on each end of it and we end up with a finished strap of about 12 inches and a short finished strap of about 6 inches. Today we need to turn these into an actual functioning hinge. Now you can certainly go right to the hinge joint and do that and leave everything else as forged if that's all you're really after. But these hinges for the Dutch tool chest, I refine just a little bit more. I want to make them just a little bit nicer than that. I want to make sure the finial is nicely shaped and not as forged. And I want to make sure the edges are nice and smooth and have a nice clean bevel on them. So that means some file work. And today is almost all bench work and all file work. There will be some sawing, filing, drilling, all that kind of stuff. Little or no forge work. I might like the propane heater, so if you hear that dull roar in the background of the video, that's probably the propane heater keeping this little area of the shop right here warm. If your hinge straps have any major lumps or bumps, or the finial's just really odd shape, because you are having trouble getting it to thin out real evenly, it's okay to go to the grinder at this point and take some off with an angle grinder, belt grinder, hard wheel grinder, whatever you want to do. But then I make sure that the final finish, the last thing that touches these surfaces, is a file. I don't want a grinder finish, I want a file finish. So the grinder is just doing the heavy work. And then I go to the files and I clean everything up and refine it all with a file. And for most of these straps, that's all they need. There's only a few of them that might need a little bit. And we're just going to look at making one hinge. We're not going to look at making all these. I've got four hinges or two sets of hinges for two tool chests that I'm working on. If you've tuned in because you're a woodworker and are looking for some information on how these hinges might be installed, Jump ahead to about the last five minutes of the video and I show real briefly how you might install a set of these Dutch tool chest hinges on your own Dutch tool chest project. But feel free to watch the entire video if you want to see how the hinges were filed and assembled. The first thing I want to do is just do the long profile. I want to get that long straight taper filed in and make sure that it looks good before I worry about any bevels or shaping the finial. Now when you file, as you push a file, you create a burr on the far side. Some of the material just kind of rolls over and it ends up being kind of sharp and it's a problem in the long run and you'll need to get rid of that. So if that burr is on the back side of the hinge, you're not going to do anything else to that and that, therefore you're going to have to come back and file it off or grind it off. But if that burr ends up on the front side of the hinge where I'm then going to come back and file a bevel anyways, I'm then getting rid of the burr as I file the bevel. So I prefer to put the show side of the hinge away from me, file towards it initially, if that creates the burr on that side, and then when I file the bevel, that burr goes away. And filing the bevel doesn't seem to create its own burr because you're not going all the way across the material. And I tend to work lengthwise, so it's kind of a diagonal stroke with the file. You can do whatever works best for you. And I just file till I have a nice clean surface. And I'm just using a, oh, it's probably a 14 inch flat bastard file. You'll probably need to readjust it, the vise, at least on the long strap, you will. Now, as I get close to this bean finial, I like to undercut it just a little bit. I think it makes it look better in the long run. So for that I use the corner of a half round file. And this squeaks a lot more. That also leaves a little point there that I need to get rid of. Now I can work on rounding this up a little bit if it needs it. And then we'll turn it over, do the same thing to the other flat edge.
So that's really all there is to that strap just to get the, the long edges established. I'm going to do the same thing to all of the straps first and do each step, if I'm doing a batch of two, four, six sets of hinges, whatever it is, I do each step to all of them before I go on to the next step. And if your finial's off, you can put it in here and do a little bit of work cleaning up these little ears that I put on there. But for our hinge, it's just time to go on to the short str strap. And because this is so short, I'm just going to use the half round file for the whole thing. Be careful not to file a little divot in here while you're working on this, it's really easy to do. And these steps can apply to just about any hinge you happen to be making. They don't have to be this exact style of hinge. see on this one I went a little deep here so I'm going to have to make this one match. And that looks better. So like I say I'll do all of those steps to all of these hinges and then we'll go on to the next step. Now if you're curious about which files I use and why, I'll put a link up here in this corner to a discussion we did previously on files. Now with all of the long edges filed, it's time to put the bevel in. If you have a filing vise, this is a great place to use it. So the filing vise holds this at a nice angle, makes it easier to file the bevel, and the big vise isn't in the way that way. And now I'm filing back towards that first flat edge and that way if there was any burr it would be in the middle and because we're not going all the way off an edge you don't get a burr. Now because this is kind of floppy material you're going to need to move it several times during this process probably. And again, we go to a half round file at the finial, just so we can get that edge into the corner there. And I file a bevel on the finial. And check it for sharp edges. It's better that you cut yourself than for your customer to cut themselves. You shouldn't cut yourself though. Of course, we want to do the same thing to the short strap.
And that's it for that strap. And just like with the files, we've previously done videos on filing vices, what they are, how to use them, and a small series on how to make a couple of different versions of the filing vise. And of course, I will link to that right up here in this corner. The next thing I want to do is put a couple little ornamental file grooves in here. This isn't anything particularly special. You could do lots of different ornamentation. You could leave the ornamentation off. It's just up to you. But this is typically what I do for this style of hinge. And for the first strap, I just eyeball where I want this, what I think looks good. That way every batch is a little bit different, but then the rest of these straps I will use this as my guide for that layout on everything else. And I have a piece of angle iron in the vise. That gives me a nice flat surface. I can clamp this up with a pair of vise grips. And that holds that pretty well. Sometimes it'll pivot, but it's not a big deal. Then I just file this in with a triangular file. And I try to roll around the edges a little bit just to make it look a little cleaner and neater. Oop. I got a bad mark there. That can be a problem when the file jumps out like that. If you don't let it go too far though, you can usually fix it. Just file that little scar off of there. Since I'm going to put these back in the forge and blacken it, you won't see where I filed that. But the grooves will show up. That's really all there is to it. I then use those as a pattern to mark the other one. But I also don't like them in the same place. I like them closer to the end, so I'm going to move that up, but I'm going to leave the spacing the same, and that's the only part of the pattern I'm using for the short strap. When I do the other long strap, I'll make sure they're done in the same place based on the finial, and that works out real well. Now you could certainly chisel these lines in, they chisel in just fine cold. If you've got a treadle hammer, it's quick and it's easy, and if you're doing big batches, it's really efficient. But the chisel doesn't leave quite the same type of line that a file does. I think the file line looks a little classier, it looks a little more elegant, it tends to be smoother, and it's easier to roll it around the edge a little bit, which really helps, I think. But another option would be to chisel it in very lightly. That gives you a nice guide for your file and saves you a little bit of time filing. And then come back and just clean it up with a file. And sometimes I'll do it that way. Just depends on the mood I'm in. If I'm doing some other decorative pattern, oftentimes chiseling is the only way to achieve that result. Now again, I would do that to all of the straps that I'm working on in this current batch. So I'm working on two sets of hinges or four pairs of straps, eight total pieces. I would do all eight pieces and then move on to the next step. And, the ne and that next step is to actually take these two parts and make a hinge out of them.
for a hinge this size, I use a three-part knuckle joint. So there's so one hinge has two on the outside with a big slot cut in the inside, and the other hinge has a single knuckle that fits inside that slot. Because it's a one-inch hinge, I like to have half of the material on one strap and half on the other strap. So the center knuckle is roughly a half inch wide and at least two quarter inch wide knuckles on this outer strap. If you're in metric, just figure out what material you have and divide it in half and then on the one that has two, divide it in half again. The other one you're good to go. I use a little scribing gauge to lay out the outer ones that set it a quarter inch. Makes it really easy to make a nice clean line that I can see. I suspect you won't be able to see it on camera but it's a nice bright silver line scribed in the material that I can see very easily. And I think these are available from industrial suppliers. I probably got this in a McMaster car. But that leaves me two nice lines that I can saw to. If I'm just doing one set of hinges, I might saw these with a hacksaw. But when I'm doing a batch, I often use the little porta band. It's real handy for this kind of thing. And I just want to saw until it just breaks free of the knuckle. I don't want it very deep here at all. That really affects the, the look of the hinge if you go too deep. Now to get this out, we're going to use a chisel. And the chisel I use is just a single bevel cold chisel. Nothing real special, but it, that way I can get it up tight right to the, the knuckle there, the part I'm going to cut out. And I don't cut all the way through, so I'm not worried about the anvil. When I created a nice weak point there, we'll go back to the vise. And then I can usually just bend that and break it right off. And then we just want to file that clean. Again, don't go too deep, but you want it to be straight across and no sharp edges. And you want to make sure that both of these parts of the joint are parallel and straight up and down. And then to make sure that my hinge pin is going to fit properly, I just run a drill bit through there and make sure it works. This is also a good time to measure your hinge pin. I just leave it you know, maybe an eighth inch over, not much more than that just enough to get a little bit of a head on there. It doesn't need to be a big decorative head unless that's what you're going for. I mark that, I'll cut that off. And this is just quarter inch cold rolled. Cold rolled comes exact size, hot rolled is usually oversized. So you're better off buying cold rolled for your hinge pins. No need to make it hardened. If it's hardened, it might crack and break and then your hinge doesn't work anymore. So I think cold rolled mild steel, or in this case it's probably 1018 mild steel, is probably the best bet. Then I go to the grinder and I just put a little bevel on the edge so that I know it's going to go in easily. If you're making a pair of hinges, you need to make two pins. Today I'm making four hinges, so I need to make four pins. I'm going to lay out the other strap. I use this first cut. And that's because this may not be perfectly even, and I can tell looking at it, it is not. So I'm better off using it as my, my layout. And pay attention to where you put the lines. In this case, my lines are just inside of this. So when I cut this with a saw, I want to leave those lines there. And if that makes it too big, it's easier to file it. For this piece, we have to leave the center section and we're going to cut these outer sections off. And this time we can do it all at the bandsaw. We don't need to go to the chisel.
Now in an ideal world, this strap is a little bit too big and you're going to have to file a little bit. I've got it pretty much perfect so I don't want to file it at all, which is less than ideal because it'd be nice to smooth it up just a little bit. But I do need to clean up these edges so I'm going to have to put this in. And I don't want to file on the sides of this, I just want to file straight down to clean up those cuts there because they're kind of pointy and sharp. Make sure there's not a burr. Double check the hole for a proper size. When using the cold rolled steel for your pin, the cold rolled steel, the process of cold rolling makes it pretty tough. It's kind of work hardened a little bit and it's a little bit harder to peen the end. So I usually throw a batch of these in the fire in some kind of a container and I bring them up to heat and let them slow cool and that anneals them or normalizes them so that they're a little softer. And then I can peen them over cold pretty easily and I don't have to use a torch. But you could heat these up with a torch and do it that way. This is one last chance before you assemble that. Does your hinge work smoothly? And yes it does. Everything lines up. Check it for straight. Because once it's assembled, you don't get another chance at it. And I like to just kind of hover the hinge off the anvil a little bit so that I'm not... so that this pin still sticks out the bottom. And I use the cross pin just to start that flaring on one side. Same thing on the other side. Then I go to the face of the hammer and I just work the edges down. That just has to be a big enough upset to keep the pin from falling out. That's all it's there for. And that should be all you need to do to assemble the hinge. And it's good and tight. Sometimes they don't work at all and you have to heat this up and you might still need a torch to heat that up or heat it up in the forge when you, they're all done just to loosen it up. But this one runs nice and smooth. And after it's run a few times, it gets a lot easier and you can put a little oil on there if you need to. One thing we haven't done is drill holes and I do generally wait till this point so I can hold on to the long strap while I'm drilling the short strap. You can drill all the holes before you assemble it if you want. And I generally eyeball the hole placements on the short strap. I know I want one somewhat close to the, the knuckle. I want one in the center of the finial. A little off there. That's better. And then I decide based on my hole, or based on my file lines, where I want the other two. And I like four per strap. Just up to you. On the long strap then, again I know I want one down here close to the, the joint. I want one centered in the finial. See how that rocks? That's one of the things we'll fix at the very end. But these I'm going to go ahead and measure to get them more symmetrical. So this usually works out to be about three and three quarters inches. The straps are sometimes a hair longer, sometimes a hair shorter. So do the math, but if I measure from this end, and make my marks there, then if this is a little off, it's much harder for anybody to tell, and it's maybe an eighth inch shorter, which doesn't hurt a thing, but because of the, the file lines, because this gets skinnier, because it's a finial, and it just looks different, it's not as obvious that that measurement is slightly different. So now I'm going to drill those holes, or you can punch them. You can certainly punch them hot, but at this stage of the game, I don't like to do that. I drill these 3 16 of an inch if it's a number 8 wood screw and I countersink them for a flathead wood screw. And I also use slotted wood screws for these. I don't think, I think 
Phillips head screws really look out of place on hand forged iron. So I provide slotted screws for any of my hardware that needs screws for mounting. If they need lag bolts, nails, whatever, that's what I provide. But for these, it's number eight by three quarter slotted flathead wood screws. And I just buy normal hardware store screws. I strip all the zinc plating off in an acid bath and then I run them through the fire to color them the same as the hinge and I wax them just like I do the hinge so they're a color match screw that really complements the ironwork and if you want to see more about that process I'll link to that video right up here. So now it's time for the only part of today's video that will occur in the forge. That is that I heat this up so that the finish is in even black everywhere. I give it a good wire brushing. I check them for straight, twist, anything like that. I correct all that, put my touch mark on it. Then as they cool, I'll put some wax finish on it and that's all there is to it. Typically the first thing I do is just heat up the joint end and make sure it runs smoothly and if there's any kind of tweaking that needs to be done. Be very careful though because this is not some place you can do any serious forging. Just taking out little bows or twists is about all you can do. Then I'll do the straps. Make sure they're flat and even. Then I can put my touch mark on. I only put it on one of the straps. I don't think one hinge needs a touch mark on both straps. And since the touch mark always puts a little bow in it, this is a good time to straighten that out. Now you could certainly file these hinges bright and leave them finished with a nice bright finish. It's just not the look I'm going for. And as the hinge starts to cool, I'll put my usual paste wax finish on. And I like to just dip the knuckle right down in the wax and let it really melt the wax into the joint. That gives it a nice long lasting lubrication in there. That's just a, a little bit on the hot side still. It's smoking a hair more than I like, but not much. So I'm going to wait, since the, the long strap is the one we did last, I'm going to let that cool just a, another minute or so there. And let's see if that's better. That's a little bit better. Now as that cools, we'll wipe that down with a rag. By the way, I am wearing an old glove that I just used for waxing so I don't get wax all over the glove I use for forging. And if it's too hot to hold with the glove, it's way too hot. So that's a look at completing one of these hinges. Again, you're going to need at least two for any kind of a serious project. A really big chest, you might want three, but most people use these in pairs. So I need to get back to work and I need to finish assembling the rest of these so I can have the two sets that I need to get done. But then I thought we could meet back up in the basement wood shop and we'll just take a real quick look at some of the details about installing these hinges. I'm not going to install them on a real project. I've never made a Dutch tool chest and I don't have one down there to look at. But I can find a scrap piece of wood just to show how you have to deal with this knuckle that's facing the wrong direction because they go on something like this. So I'm going to get back to work. I'll see you in just a split second down in the basement. I was able to get all four hinges done, so I have two pair, enough to do two boxes. One set is ordered, and those will be shipping off to a customer as soon as I get the hasp 
and the handles that go with his order done. And that leaves me a second set that I'll take to the next Lee Nielsen hand tool event so I have some available to sell. Since these hinges have a little bit of a unique installation requirement, I thought I would show you just a little bit about what that might look like. I don't actually have a Dutch tool chest to show you on, and I'm not going to build a mock-up lid or anything like that. I'm just going to show you how this knuckle has to be inlet into the back panel so that everything sits flush and plays nice. But remember, as a woodworker, I'm a pretty good blacksmith. Now the lids on the Dutch tool chest are usually in at a slant, usually about 30 degrees. I didn't bother to measure this, I just planed a random slant on the edge of this board. And the hinge usually goes on with the long strap on the inside so that when you lift the lid you can see it, and the short strap on the outside. If you just put them in like this though, you've got the big gap here, that's not desirable. So this needs to be inlet down into the, the back wall of the chest. So I'm just going to mark the sides of this with a marking knife. So I know where to inlet it. Now it's going to need to come down that far. And that would be a good place to just set a gauge, and that'll tell me how deep to go. So this is mostly just a matter of sawing that in and chiseling out the waste. Typically I would turn this towards me, but also clamp it further down the vise typically, but I'm trying to make this easy for you to see. Just try the hinge in until it's flush. Okay, so I hope you woodworkers know how to do this better than I do. One of these days I'll build a Dutch tool chest and then I'll have a sample with hinges on it. But with all the other projects I have, that could be a while. So it's really pretty common with a lot of hardware that you have to do a little bit of woodworking to make the hardware fit. That's pretty darn close right there. And I want to inlet this top strap down so it's also flush. And that way you don't have to inlet it into the lid, it sits flush on the lid. If you're a follower of Chris Schwarz's blogs or have seen the Lee Nielsen video where Chris builds the Dutch tool chest, you're probably better off following his instructions than you are my instructions. Well, that could stand just a little bit more, but I don't know if we really need to worry about it too much since this is just a scrap piece to give you the idea. And my guess is you've kind of got the idea by now. By the way, the chisel is one I forged. There we go. Now the back strap could be screwed right to the back of the chest. 
The inside strap is flush with the top here so that your lid for the chest can sit tight with the, the top of the chest so it doesn't get dust and bugs in there. And then when you lift it up, the long strap is visible on the inside of the chest. And because of the way the strap is designed, this will only go back so far and you can use it as a lid support, but I really don't recommend it. I don't think that small of a hinge joint should have that kind of stress on it. I'm sure you woodworkers watching the video have some other ideas on how you might do it. And if you take your time and do a little bit cleaner job of it, it really looks quite good. And they're a very elegant approach to putting the lid on your Dutch tool chest if you're making a Dutch tool chest. For you blacksmiths out there, again, I consider this to be somewhat of a proprietary design for my shop. So if you're making a Dutch tool chest for yourself, by all means, go ahead and make a set of these. It's not going to bother me at all if you make them for yourself. But I would appreciate it if you don't go into business making Dutch tool chest hinges. Anyways, that's all I have for today. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't done so already, I would love it if you hit that subscribe button. Feel free to take some time, watch a few of the other videos, share the videos with your friends, but then make time in your day to get out to your shop, make something, but stay safe, wear your safety glasses, and we'll see you for the next one.